Hi, my name is Bryn Boslett and I am an infectious disease doctor at the University of California, San Francisco. And today I'm going to be talking about the risk factors for and prevention of influenza, particularly the severe complications of influenza virus. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the risk factors associated with severe influenza disease, as well as the immunological basis of these risks. You should be able to describe several strategies for prevention of influenza in adults and children. And finally, you should be able to list the types of influenza vaccine available and explain the indications and contraindications for influenza vaccination. You recently learned about some of the severe complications of influenza, particularly pneumonia, which can lead to respiratory failure and in some cases even death from the disease. There are certain populations who are at higher risk than others for developing the severe complications of influenza virus. Those patients at the extremes of age, elderly and infants, are at the highest risk of infectious complications from influenza. The infant immune system is immature compared to the adult immune system, and this has a critical impact on susceptibility to respiratory viral infections. There is a general naivety of the infant immune system. The lack of prior exposure to pathogens leads to a lack of immune memory. Maternal IgG antibodies that were passed to the infant via the placenta in utero are generally depleted by approximately six months postpartum, leaving infants susceptible to infection at that time. Maternal IgA, which is contained in breast milk, coats infant mucosal surfaces and protects mainly against enteric bacterial infections until the newborn can synthesize its own antibodies. However, IgA is generally not protective against influenza. Finally, there is a tendency towards hyporesponsive immunity early in life, characterized by both reduced innate and adaptive immune responses. This is a critical adaptation to survive early life exposure to previously unseen but non-pathogenic antigens of both self and foreign origins. In older adults, immune defenses become weaker with advancing age. This places adults over 65 years old at greater risk of severe disease from influenza. The effects of aging on the immune system manifest at multiple levels and include reduced production of B and T cells in bone marrow and thymus and also diminished function of mature lymphocytes in our secondary lymphoid tissues. As a result, elderly individuals do not respond efficiently to both new and previously encountered antigens. As you can imagine, this also decreases the body's ability to have a robust immune response after receiving influenza vaccination. Additionally, patients with diabetes, chronic kidney disease, or other immunosuppressive conditions are high risk for similar reasons. Underlying heart or lung disease is also associated with worse outcomes of influenza virus infection. The high mortality rates seen during the 2009-2010 H1N1 epidemic further highlighted two additional high-risk groups, obese patients and pregnant women. Obesity has been shown to be an independent risk factor for severe influenza disease because obesity has substantial effects on the immune system. Immune cells and adipocytes share similarities in the production of various inflammatory mediators. Adipose tissue interacts with the immune system via secretion of adipokines, which are pro-inflammatory similar to cytokines. An overabundance of adipose tissue in the state of obesity violates the well-balanced interactions between adipocytes and immune cells with subsequent disturbance to immune system surveillance. The details of this phenomenon are still being discovered, but overall, this leads to a dysregulated immune response, impaired chemotaxis, and altered macrophage differentiation. Pregnancy has long been recognized as a risk factor for influenza-related morbidity and mortality. And data have actually indicated that pregnant women have a three to four fold increased risk for influenza related hospitalizations or even death compared to non pregnant women. It was previously thought that pregnancy confers a very general immunosuppression, 
in order to ensure tolerance of the growing fetus. However, more recent data actually contradict the idea of systemic immunosuppression during pregnancy. Adequate immunologic responses to vaccinations in pregnant women and the fact that pregnant women do not seem on a whole to be more susceptible to infections in general tends to contradict our original theory. So what exactly is going on in pregnant women? There are several theories. As pregnancy progresses, hormone levels change dramatically and are considerably higher than at any other time. The interplay between sex hormones and the immune system is complex and multifactorial, and it affects many organ systems. T regulatory cells are a component of the immune system that suppresses immune responses of other cells, particularly T cells. This is an important self-check built into the immune system to prevent excessive reactions. However, during pregnancy, the activity of T regulatory cells actually increases, thus decreasing the robustness of cell-mediated immunity. This shift may be responsible for altered responses to respiratory viral infections during pregnancy, and it could explain the increased severity of infections such as influenza, in which cell-mediated immunity is very important. Besides this, the cardiopulmonary adaptive changes that occur during pregnancy, such as increased heart rate and reduced pulmonary residual capacity, may increase the risk of hypoxemia, which can further contribute to increased severity of influenza disease. One of the strongest and most important medical interventions against influenza is prevention of the virus. Of all vaccine preventable diseases, seasonal influenza is the number one cause of hospitalizations and deaths. As mentioned in the last module, a non-vaccinated person who has been exposed to the influenza virus can receive the antiviral medication oseltamivir, which has some evidence of efficacy. Finally, infection control measures such as regular hand washing for all, plus eye protection and surgical masks for healthcare workers in contact with infectious patients can also help to reduce the spread of the disease. More than 100 national influenza centers in over 100 countries conduct year-round surveillance for influenza virus. This involves receiving and testing thousands of influenza virus samples from patients with suspected flu illness. The laboratories then send representative viruses to the World Health Organization collaborating centers who get together in February of each year to review the data. Afterwards, the World Health Organization makes recommendations for the composition of the seasonal influenza vaccine for the Northern Hemisphere. Influenza strains are injected into the allantoic fluid of fertilized chicken eggs, where the virus is allowed to multiply over the course of about 48 hours. Once ready, the egg is cracked and the allantoic fluid is removed, generating around 15 micrograms of material for the influenza vaccine. At this point, the viruses are weakened or killed and the viral antigen is purified. Each year, over 100 million eggs are used to create the seasonal influenza vaccine. Each seasonal influenza vaccine consists of antigens representing three or four influenza virus strains. Generally, two influenza type A strains and either one or two influenza type B strains. These viruses are killed or inactivated with formalin to create an injectable vaccine that we know as the flu shot, which is either trivalent, meaning three strains, or quadrivalent, meaning four strains. Adults aged 65 and over may benefit from a higher dose of the influenza vaccine due to the diminished function of their mature lymphocytes, leading to the decreased ability to have a strong immune response to vaccination. Data from clinical trials comparing regular to high-dose influenza vaccine among persons aged 65 or older indicate that higher antibody levels occur after vaccination with a high-dose flu shot. Whether or not the improved immune response leads to greater protection has actually been a topic of ongoing research. A 2014 study published in the New England Journal of Medicine indicated that the high-dose vaccine 
was 24% more effective in preventing flu in the elderly population relative to a standard dose vaccine. There is also a live attenuated influenza vaccine that is administered as a nasal spray. This vaccine may induce a broader immune response, including mucosal immunity. The CDC is now recommending that all healthy children between age two and eight receive the live attenuated vaccination where available because there's evidence that young children do not have as robust of an immune response to the flu shot compared to adults. However, because this vaccine is inhaled, it is generally avoided in patients with severe asthma. Also, because the vaccine contains a weakened but not killed virus, patients with impaired immune systems should avoid this vaccine. It is also avoided in pregnant women. As a reminder, a few other examples of live attenuated viral vaccines include the measles, mumps, and rubella, oral polio, rotavirus, yellow fever, and varicella vaccinations. Generally, all patients aged six months or greater are eligible to receive an influenza vaccine each season. Children under age six months old are the pediatric group at highest risk of influenza complications, but unfortunately they are too young to get an influenza vaccine. The best way to protect young children is to make sure that household members and their caregivers are vaccinated against influenza. The most common adverse effects of influenza vaccine is pain at the site of injection. Other systemic effects might include fever, headache, and muscle ache, which typically last for less than 48 hours. More rare adverse events associated with the influenza vaccine include immediate hypersensitivity reaction and a condition known as Guillain-Barré syndrome. Guillain-Barré syndrome, or GBS, is a rare disorder in which a person's own immune system damages their nerve cells, causing muscle weakness and sometimes paralysis, which is usually temporary but can leave long-term sequelae. There have been rare deaths associated with GBS due to weakness in respiratory muscles. However, the frequency of this complication is one or two cases per 100 million vaccinated persons, which, incidentally, is the same GBS occurrence rate in the non-vaccinated population. There are some precautions and contraindications to keep in mind for the influenza vaccine. People who have had a severe reaction to an influenza vaccination in the past should not be revaccinated. Patients with a history of Guillain-Barre following receipt of an influenza vaccine have a high risk of recurrence with subsequent vaccination. And if this person is not at high risk of severe influenza complications, they should generally not be vaccinated. A history of egg allergy is a somewhat uh, controversial topic. A review of published data on over 4,000 patients, a little over 500 of whom were reported to have a history of severe egg allergy, noted that zero occurrences of anaphylaxis were reported, suggesting that severe allergic reactions to egg-based influenza vaccines are very unlikely. However, given the overall uncertainty about this, persons with a history of severe egg allergy may instead receive an inactivated recombinant influenza vaccine, known as RIV3, which is actually not grown in chicken eggs. Less severe reactions, such as GI upset in association with egg consumption, should not affect a person's ability to receive the standard influenza vaccine. Please remember that the overall goal of influenza vaccination is not primarily to completely prevent the influenza infection. The goal is actually to prevent the severe complications from influenza, particularly in our most vulnerable patients. So please work hard to educate your patients, family members, and friends about the importance of the influenza vaccine. Thank you so much for your time and attention.